Our next section is central nervous system infections. You can count on this being on everybody's test, at least several questions for meningitis and encephalitis for everyone. All CNS infections will give you fever and a headache and vomiting and nausea and seizures. You cannot distinguish them by these symptoms, nor can you answer the question, what is the most likely diagnosis, simply by the presence of these symptoms. It's these symptoms and something else that allows you to answer the question, what is the most likely diagnosis? So here are those clues. When you see stiff neck, photophobia, meningismus, Stiff neck, photophobia, and meningismus. Remember, the meninges is a $5 Greek word for covering. And when that covering is inflamed, the diagnosis is meningitis. When there is fever, headache, and confusion, the diagnosis is encephalitis. And finally, when there are focal neurologic findings, the diagnosis is abscess. Now, they can be mixed, and if they're mixed, you're not going to be able to answer the question, what is the most likely diagnosis? But if they want you to know the answer, they have to tell you something, and this is what they'll tell you in order to answer the most likely diagnosis question. Meningitis is an, either an infection or an inflammation of the meningeal covering, and those meninges are divided up into several layers. The pia is the closest thing, the arachnoid, and on the outside is the dura mater. Now, all the infections that we're talking about are all underneath the dura mater, that is, between the dura mater and the brain. If this were a step one microbiology section, you would have many more questions about these organisms that cause meningitis. Your answer is very straightforward for us. The most common cause of meningitis from bacteria is streptococcus pneumonia. It has been, and it always has been. And also group B strep, group B strep, also known as strep A galactiae, is the most common in neonatal meningitis. Very little in adults, but mostly in small babies. In Haemophilus influenza is markedly down, markedly reduced because of influenza vaccination amongst children. The rates of Haemophilus influenza meningitis are probably down 90 to 95%, slightly more over the last 30 years. Neisseria meningitis, there is unfortunately not a conclusive Neisseria meningitis vaccination that will take care of Neisseria meningitis group B. The others will be taken care of by meningococcal vaccine, but not group B. That's why you can still get Neisseria meningitis infection of the central nervous system. Listeria is a small amount and only in special circumstances, which we will make sure you know that it is people who are immunocompromised, and this is especially important to recognize because you have to add ampicillin because you have to change therapy. So recognizing listeria is especially important because it changes the answer to the question, what is the best initial therapy? When there is a case description of recent neurosurgery, any cutting of the skin around the brain, will result in increased incidence of staphylococcus. Now that could be both sensitive staphylococcus, resistant staph aureus, sometimes known as methicillin resistant staph aureus or MRSA, or staph epidermidis. And staph epidermidis, which is a normal commensal flora of the skin, when it goes into the central nervous system, it becomes pathologic. But that doesn't happen in an ordinary person. It has to follow some degree of cutting or neurosurgery. When you see fever, headache, stiff neck, and photophobia, the most likely diagnosis is unquestionably meningitis. Matter of fact, this is so straightforward, it's unlikely that they'll ask you just a simple question whether it's meningitis or not, and you'll have to elaborate on that and say what particular type. But this presentation by itself is not enough to say. You can't say by itself that this is cryptococcus or hemophilus or Neisseria or viral or fungal meningitis just from this presentation. This is the root. We have to see what's added in order to answer the other questions on diagnosis. When the symptoms are present over a very short period of time, happening over several hours only, you should suspect acute bacterial meningitis with one of the bacteria just mentioned. Now, meningitis, interestingly, can give you focal abnormalities in as many as 30% of patients. So the presence of focal abnormalities does not exclude bacterial meningitis. It just means that you have to do a CAT scan of the head before you do the lumbar puncture. But one out of three patients can have focal findings. If there is confusion, you simply can't answer the question, what's the most likely diagnosis without a CT and an LP? 
That's because confusion makes the neurological examination inaccurate and you simply cannot rely on it to allow you to exclude the focal findings if the person is severely confused. Cryptomechacal meningitis is slow, goes on over several weeks. Even in HIV, it's still a very slow affair. Let's look down this list. When you see a stiff neck and photophobia, and the patient is AIDS and has less than 100 T cells, the most likely diagnosis is cryptococcal meningitis. However, if your question describes a camper or a hiker or a person on a camping trip, if it describes a rash, target-like lesion, in other words, it's red on the outside, pale on the inside, joint pain, facial palsy, rash, joint, and facial, the diagnosis when there is a tick. Now, tick bites are not remembered in most people because the tick of Lyme disease is extremely small. So therefore, you have to look for a camper and a hiker to give you the substitute history of the tick. Another camper and hiker who has a rash that starts out peripherally and then moves towards the body called centripetal, when this occurs, the tick is often remembered in many more patients because it's a much bigger tick. That's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Look at the difference there between the other meningitis disease here in Lyme and Rocky Mountain. It's a camper and a hiker and a hiker and a camper to tell you that this is most likely to be a tick-borne disease because ticks just don't happen in urban areas that much. So when they want you to know the answer, they have to tell you something. Pulmonary tuberculosis precedes tuberculosis meningitis in 85% of patients. It's very unusual to bypass the lungs and go straight to the meninges. Also, if you see in that case that it describes a recent immigrant or a person with very high CSF protein, that is extraordinarily suggestive and you should answer tuberculosis as that diagnosis when they show you a recent immigrant less than five years, recent immigrant less than five years with lung disease. When there is nothing, in other words, a diagnosis of exclusion. They didn't tell me anything else. A diagnosis of exclusion. A diagnosis of exclusion is viral meningitis. It's not a camper and a hiker. There's not AIDS. There's not a person who's got a target-shaped lesion or a lesion moving towards the arms or from the arms. Nothing viral. And finally, when there's an adolescent patient, 14, 15, 16-year-old with a petechial rash, the most likely diagnosis is Neisseria meningitis. Keeping on with our format, the best initial test is a lumbar puncture in most patients. You do not have to do a CT scan of the head unless there are special circumstances. The best initial, most accurate test is a lumbar puncture for meningitis. On that cerebrospinal fluid, the culture is never available at the time we're making the diagnosis. So you can't use culture to help you to choose what is there. The gram stain is not specific enough, so we're making our decision based on cell count. And if there's thousands of neutrophils, you will have most likely diagnosis bacterial meningitis. Now, the thousands of neutrophils by itself cannot tell you which type of bacterial meningitis. The thousand neutrophils by itself can only tell you that you have bacterial meningitis, not which one, but it's enough to be able to tell you Hey, this is not Lyme or Rickettsia or Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Hey, this is not tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, Lyme, Rickettsia, Borrelia, Burgdorferi, the other spirochetes, is a couple of dozen to a couple hundred lymphs. The same as it is in viral meningitis, a couple of dozen to a couple of hundred lymphocytes. Bacterial meningitis has thousands of polys, and the protein level on CSF is always markedly increased. Now, the other forms of meningitis can have a high protein as well. The only one for whom a high protein is really good is the tuberculosis. An elevated protein goes along most with tuberculosis. But the most important question is, which is the single most sensitive test to exclude TB meningitis? See, when you have patients coming in with meningitis, the most important thing is to know when can you exclude a particular disease and bacterial meningitis, and especially TB meningitis, are excluded when the protein is normal. The glucose level, although decreased in bacterial and possibly decreased in the others, is not sensitive or specific enough to be very helpful to you. Not as helpful as the gram stain and viral culture, the gram stain and bacterial culture. The gram stain will be positive 
a little bit better than half of bacterial meningitis. That's a really good test. And culture, 90%. That's how we're going to answer the question, what's the most likely diagnosis? Because in the others, they're going to be negative. When is a head CT the best initial test? If before the lumbar puncture there is papilledema or seizures or focal neurologic findings or severe confusion, you can't do an accurate neurological exam if you don't have an awake alert patient. And if you have this fuzzed out, beautiful picture, beautiful picture of papilledema, you can be sure that there's intracranial pressure raised in a way that'll make the patient herniate. Just remember, if you've got to do the CT, it's a delay to lumbar puncture. And delay to lumbar puncture means start therapy first. You see, a neurological exam, in order to exclude focal neurologic deficits, needs to a patient who understands and follows instructions and answers questions. And you can't do an accurate neuro exam if the patient is severely confused. You can't look into their eyes for papilledema if they're very confused. You have to have an awake, alert, and cooperative patient to do an accurate neurological exam. And if there is a contraindication to immediate LP, Giving antibiotics is the best initial step in management. It's better to treat and decrease the accuracy of a test than risk permanent vein damage. That means if it describes focal findings or a seizure or confusion, the next best step is ceftriaxone, and vancomycin and steroids, not the CT because you don't want to wait for their head to be cooking in the CT scanner and delaying therapy. Delay the lumbar puncture means treat first. And if you're going to delay the lumbar puncture, it is because of focal findings, papilledema, seizures, or severe confusion. So what are bacterial antigen detection methods the correct answer? These are also known as latex agglutination tests, and they're similar in accuracy to the gram stain, which means if they're positive, they're extremely specific. But if negative, you definitely could still have the infection. They range in sensitivity between 60 and 90 percent, and they're simply not sufficiently sensitive to exclude bacterial meningitis. So when is a bacterial antigen test indicated? Number one thing for those who received antibiotics prior to lumbar puncture. A little bit of antibiotics can make the culture falsely negative. This is an excellent test to be able to detect the infection in those who might otherwise have a falsely negative culture. Let's go further in answering this question. What is the most accurate diagnostic test? For tuberculosis, we want to look at three high volume lumbar punctures and do an acid fast stain and culture on them. The reason it's a high volume lumbar puncture is because the number of organisms in the cerebrospinal fluid for tuberculosis meningitis is very small. So you've got to centrifuge them down to concentrate the organisms. This increases the yield. And TB has a CSF protein that's very, very high. Now an uncentrifuged sample has a sensitivity on CSF that's extremely low, less than 10%. Now, this is a very cumbersome thing to do, to do three high-volume centrifuge specimens, but that is the answer. Lyme and rickettsia are simply not visible in a gram stain. They're not visible in a gram stain. They don't grow in regular culture medium because regular culture medium doesn't have cells in it. And rickettsia are an intracellular organism. Lyme disease, as Borrelia burgdorferi, is a spirochete. And a spirochete is not visible in a regular gram stain. So we must do specific serologic testing, the ELISA, the Western blot, and the PCR. The key issue is always to say, well, how do I know to send them? And the answer to that is you look for campers and hikers and hikers and campers. Cryptococcus should be found in a person who's got HIV. And the best initial test is an India ink, which has about a 60 or 70% sensitivity. The most accurate test is a cryptococcal antigen, which is a very accurate test and also changes in response to therapy. Antigens change and antibodies don't in response to therapy. Viral meningitis is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to exclude all the things on the left side of the image you're seeing now. At the end of the day, it's viral. The best initial therapy is ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and steroids. Now that's with bacterial meningitis, and you base your treatment answer on the cell count, symptoms in the cell count. Culture may be the most accurate test, but it needs two to three days to become positive.
So we can never use the culture as our method of making the treatment decision since we need far too long to be able to determine if the culture is going to be positive. It's never available when the treatment decision is made. Then the gram stain is good if it's positive, but the false negative rate is 30 to 50 percent. 30 to 50 percent false negative rate. That means you can't use this test if it's negative. If it's positive, it's helpful. If it's negative, it's worthless. Protein and glucose are simply too nonspecific to be useful, and they don't allow treatment decisions. They just don't. When is the answer steroids? And the steroid that we use for bacterial meningitis is dexamethasone. Well, this answer is very clear. One, it lowers mortality only in strep pneumonia. Number two, it is the answer to give when thousands of neutrophils are present on the CSF. And there's no cultured results that are available for several days. Thousands of neutrophils on cerebrospinal spinal fluid means ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and steroids. You add ampicillin if the patient is immunocompromised for coverage of listeria. Not everyone needs that ampicillin, only if people are immunocompromised. Listeria monocytogenes is a very uncommon cause of bacterial meningitis. The most characteristic feature that you need to know for your Step 2 examination is that it is resistant to all forms of cephalosporins not just ceftriaxone, but all of them. Consequently, since it is sensitive to penicillins, and the standard of care is not a penicillin, you have to know when to answer it. You add ampicillin to ceftriaxone and vancomycin if the case describes risk factors for listeria. You can't be a mind reader. It's not like life, where you have to say, are you telling me things? No, here they'll have to tell you. They'll have to tell you that the person is elderly or neonate or steroid using HIV or AIDS or immunocompromised, including alcoholism in a major way, pregnant or bone marrow transplant, leukemia, lymphoma. It has to be very straightforward and not small stuff, but very big stuff. Elderly neonates who use steroids with AIDS who are pregnant. The level of respiratory isolation for Neisseria and the rifampin or ciprofloxacin to close contacts is for major fluid contact. A close contact needs the kind of respiratory fluid contact you would get from household contacts, kissing, sharing cigarettes, or eating utensils. And that is because this is a droplet contact. You cannot transmit Neisseria to someone across a room. You have to be within touching distance. Routine school and work contacts simply are not close contacts from the point of view of Neisseria. The question will describe a healthcare worker who says that they want prophylaxis, they're anxious. The nurse or the medical student wants prophylaxis. Well, the answer is no, because healthcare workers only qualify for prophylaxis if they have intubated the patient or performed suction or have had heavy, heavy contact with respiratory secretions. The general answer for Neisseria prophylaxis is generally no. A man comes to the emergency department with fever and a headache and stiff neck, photophobia. He has weakness in his arm and his leg. What's the next best step in management? Well, out of these choices, this person has clear meningitis, but he also has a focal neurologic deficit. So he needs a head CT, and a head CT is good, but antibiotics with ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and steroids is gooder because this man has a contraindication to the lumbar puncture. He's got focal neurologic deficits. You've got to initiate therapy. You can't send him off to head CT and develop permanent neurologic damage while waiting for that CT to be normal. You've got to give the antibiotics because he may never get a lumbar puncture. Ceftriaxone alone is simply not enough. Steroids alone is simply not sufficient. And neurology consultation, don't consult. You don't need a consultant to tell you to do the head CT and to give the antibiotics. Give the antibiotics first when you have major meningitis and there's a delay to lumbar puncture. Getting a head CT means a delay to lumbar puncture. Consultation is almost always a wrong answer on step two. That's because you're not supposed to need that consultant to tell you what to do. What's the most common neurological deficits of untreated bacterial meningitis? And why does that eighth cranial nerve deficit happen? Well, we don't know. We don't know. We just know that the nerve is damaged as it leaves the spine and goes out to the peripheral world.
deafness can occur in 20 to 40 percent of untreated patients. Encephalitis is defined by the acute onset of fever and confusion, altered mental status, obtentation. There are a lot of causes, but herpes simplex is simply the most common cause. Now, because there's confusion, disorientation, you've always got to do a head CT first. Because look at these things, this white stuff under the arrows there. That's herpes eating your temporal lobe. But how do you know there wasn't a mass under there? Well, you don't. Well, how do you know that there's not focal deficits if the person is confused and you can't do an accurate neurological exam? Well, you don't. So if you have acute femoral confusion, CTLP. What is the most accurate test of herpes encephalitis? Well, I will tell you, this is unquestionably the single most frequently asked question on step two for herpes encephalitis. What is the diagnosis? And the answer is the PCR. Now, the sh most striking thing is, is that it's not a brain biopsy. Almost everything else, taking a direct piece would be better. In this case, it's very weird. It's less accurate than the PCR. Now, this is one of those things where you could want it to be better for the biopsy. You could say, it should be better. Why isn't it better? It's a piece of brain tissue. It ought to be better. And I agree with you. It's just not better, and it's the answer, is PCR. PCR is simply more accurate. More cases are detected on PCR than on brain biopsy compared to autopsy studies. Now, MRI might be the radiologic test you do for strokes or multiple sclerosis, but for infections, the radiologic test is never the most accurate test, not on an infection. Viral culture is a test that you get for genital and skin lesions, not for cerebrospinal fluid and not for the brain. The same way Zank prep is the answer for initial test for genital lesions. You Zank skin and genital, but not the brain. Finally, serology for herpes is wrong because it's simply useless. 95% of the general population is seropositive for herpes simplex. The initial therapy for herpes encephalitis has been acyclovir for decades. The best initial therapy for herpes is going to stay acyclovir because famcyclovir and valcyclovir simply are unavailable in an intravenous form. And you've got to use intravenous for herpes encephalitis. When is foscarnet the answer? Foscarnet has a different mechanism of action. It doesn't work by inhibiting thymidine kinase like acyclovir. So it is used when there's acyclovir-resistant herpes, when the herpes is mutated so that it can't be controlled by acyclovir. A woman with herpes encephalitis confirmed by PCR gets four days of acyclovir. Her creatinine continues to rise. It rises. What's the most appropriate next step in management? And the answer is... Well, you can't stop acyclovir. You reduce the dose of acyclovir and one of them. You can't stop the acyclovir. You've got to treat her. You can't just stop the acyclovir. She's got encephalitis. She's going to die. But she's got renal insufficiency. So give her less. You can't treat herpes in the brain with pills like oral vamcyclovir and valacyclovir. Not enough. It's insufficient for herpes encephalitis. Gee, why not switch to foscarnet? That was good for acyclovir-resistant herpes. Why not switch to foscarnet? Well, switch to foscarnet is wrong because we were lowering a dose of acyclovir because of renal insufficiency and nephrotoxicity. Why not switch to foscarnet? Because it's more nephrotoxic than the acyclovir. Nephrotoxic is greater in foscarnet. So leave them on the acyclovir, reduce the dose, and water them, hydrate them.